I think you know that the observed warming is much less than the models have been predicting. And so the na most natural explanation is that the models have grossly exaggerated the effects of CO2. Few people realize that the Earth is in a CO2 famine compared to geological history. Because then uh, where would the emergency be? You, you have to have a climate emergency in order to uh, justify these massive power grabs of governments around the world, you know, seize complete control of everyone's life. Alle wetenschappers zijn het eens. En er is een enorm klimaatprobleem. Nou, vergeet het maar. Die wetenschappers zijn het niet eens. En zelfs als het zo zou zijn, dan zegt dat nog niks. Wetenschap is geen democratie, alleen de harde feiten tellen. En dan is, al dus Albert Einstein, één goed onderbouwd verhaal voldoende om de hele wetenschap te veranderen. Dat is vooruitgang. Maar dat soort vooruitgang, daar houden de meeste klimaatwetenschappers niet van. Sceptici worden eruit gewerkt. Dus je moet heel sterk in je schoenen staan om je stem te durven verheffen. Nou, dat staat professor William Happer van de Princeton University dan ook. Hij is een gevierd natuurkundige met een schitterende staat van dienst. In de jaren negentig ontsloeg toenmalig vicepresident El Gorham vanwege zijn wetenschappelijke instelling en hij heeft sindsdien zijn mond niet gehouden. Meer CO2 is goed voor ons, want we krijgen daardoor veel meer voedsel tot onze beschikking. En voor dramatische temperatuursverhoging hoeven we niet te vrezen. Dat blijft zeer beperkt. Will Happer. Well, the, the whole narrative is nonsense. It's uh, simply a power grab, you know, a, a pretext to grab lots of power. You know, more CO2 will be good for the Earth, you know, the, and we... I'm sure you know that they put CO2 intentionally into greenhouses so that you get better uh, yields of uh, flowers and fruits and vegetables. And uh, you have to pay for the CO2. And um, so it's an expense, but it's an expense worth paying for because the results are so good. The other thing is that uh, few people realize that the Earth is in a CO2 famine compared to geological history. You know, we know pretty well what CO2 has been over the last 500 million years, 540. And um, almost all that time it's been much higher than now. So plants, trees, you know, crops are adapted to much higher levels of CO2 and they do better with more CO2. And we're already seeing the Earth getting greener from satellites. But what happens if... CO2 doubles. It's 400 ppm now, and suppose it ever gets to 800 ppm. There's still a long way off, but what would happen then to world food production and to temperature? Well, the uh, measurements on greenhouses indicate that productivity goes up approximately as the square root of the CO2 concentration. And so a factor of two, if you take the square root of two, it's 40%, 1.4. And so that would be about a 40% increase in productivity of forestry and agriculture. So why is that bad? <laughs> well, because um, the Earth is at the same time warming very much. Well, the warming will be uh, quite small. Nobody quite knows what the warming will be, but the, my own best estimates are around one degree centigrade, maybe 1.4, maybe 0.8. That's consistent with what's being observed. I think you know that the observed warming is much less than the models have been predicting. And so the na most natural explanation is that the models have grossly exaggerated the effects of CO2. We're told uh, entire ecosystems are going to collapse uh, with, with even the slightest increase of temperature. Well, of course, it's nonsense. You know, ecosystems are extremely tough and they're designed to handle fluctuations in temperature and rainfall and everything yeah. else. If they weren't designed that way, they would have been extinct long ago. <laughs> it's the typical right-wing approach. Uh, well, uh, no, it's not right-wing. You know, I'm uh, not very political, but I do believe in uh, reason and looking at facts, and the facts don't support any of this hysteria. There's no scientific, no observational support to it, either theoretical uh, support either, yeah. 
But you say that uh, temperature will not increase by more than about one degree Celsius. Um, why d doesn't the IPCC say that so? Because then uh, where would the emergency be? You, you have to have a climate emergency in order to uh, justify these massive power grabs of governments around the world, you know, seize complete control of everyone's life. And so one degree isn't enough uh, to justify that. So you have to push it up to at least three. It would be better if you could push it up to 10, but you'd be laughed out of the room at 10. So three is a good compromise. You know, it's much too big, but it doesn't seem ludicrous to most people. It seems ludicrous to me because I know how it works. And the way they do that, I mean, just, just to go a little further, is everyone agrees that if the direct effect of doubling CO2 is around one degree. And so to get three degrees, you have to invent positive feedbacks, uh, typically from water vapor and from cloud cover changes. And so that's where these big numbers come from. It's from these alleged positive feedbacks, which don't seem to exist. And I might point out that, you know, feedbacks are well known in nature. Most feedbacks are negative. There's even a Chat Le Chatelier's principle, you can look it up on Google, you know, that yeah. says that, you know, if you make a change in a system, usually the, ch the system tries to make it smaller. It doesn't try to make it bigger. <laughs> it's all made up. You know, and but it's but propaganda. Sea level rise, uh, forest f uh, fires, uh, the North Pole disappearing. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Well, we've always had forest fires, and uh, they've been much worse uh, in the last decade or two because of bad forest management, at least in the United States. I hope Holland has been smarter than we have, but we've suppressed fires for too long. Before the Europeans came to California, for example, the Indians burnt all of California every year. Yeah. And uh, so it's a, a very unnatural state now compared to when the Europeans first arrived. It's much more susceptible to fire now than it used to be. But the, but the poles? The poles, uh, the South Pole continues to get colder, you know, and measurements don't show any warming of the Antarctic continent. For most of the continent, there's a little bit of warming on the peninsula that goes up towards South America, West Antarctica, but it's quite small. Um, but most of, by far, the biggest effect is cooling over the entire continent of Antarctica. North, you know, Antarctic, uh, uh, the Arctic, you know, the North Pole, it's hard to tell whether very much is happening because there the climate fluctuates tremendously, much more than the Arct Antarctic because the oceans are connected to the Arctic, you know, there's the Bering Straits and the Straits uh, between Norway and, and Greenland and so ocean currents have a big effect on the Arctic. And it's, it's never been stable, it's always fluctuated up and down. So nobody knows how much the changes that we're observing today are natural and how much might be due to t CO2. I think they're mostly natural. But the islands in the Pacific are disappearing. No, they're not disappearing. You know, the ocean has risen 200 meters since the end of the last ice age, you know, 12,000 years ago. The islands have simply grown up along with the rising sea level because they're oh, made of on, coral. Uh, doctor, the islands going up? Yes, yes, because coral reefs and uh, coral grows at a certain level below the sea level. If it's too low, it can't grow. There's not enough sunlight. If it's too high, the waves wash it away. So islands uh, go up when the sea level goes up. They go down when the sea level goes down. And they've been doing that forever. And so... No reason to worry whatsoever. No, I mean, uh, I, I think there's lots of reason to worry from these misguided policies that are being proposed, but there's no reason to worry from nature. Now, I, let, let me just add one thing, and that is that you do have real pollutants if you use uh, fossil fuels, for example, if you don't have the proper uh, emission controls on coal, you can dump ash all over the neighborhood and uh, I'm 100% in favor of controlling real pollution but I don't like squandering money on imaginary pollution that isn't pollution at all but it's actually a benefit to the world. Uh, one of the benefits of CO2 is that it makes plants uh, 
more economical in their use of water, so they need only half as much water if you double CO2. The reason satellites are observing more greening of the earth, and that's very clear, there's no question about that now, it's mainly because of the water efficiency. The greening is most pronounced in arid regions. You see major greening in the Sahel, you know, south of the Sahara. You see major greening in the western United States, you know, or semi-desert, or in western Australia. And that's because of this enhanced uh, water efficiency for plants due to more CO2. There's another problem that is uh, the tundra is defrosting and releasing enormous amounts of methane. And methane is a gas that is, what is it, 20 times more uh, important as a greenhouse gas than CO2. I may be incorrect, but you correct me. Um, so that's a huge threat, the, the thawing of the tundra. Okay, let's talk about methane. It is true that uh, per methane molecule, uh, you get about 30 times more forcing, radiative forcing, which is a measure of temperature, than you get from CO2. So one methane molecule is worth, uh, is worth 30 CO2 molecules, but we're releasing 300 CO2 molecules for every methane molecule. So you have to divide by 300, so that means it's really only a tenth. The warming from methane is roughly 10% of the warming we're getting from CO2, one-tenth. It's not 30 times, it's one-tenth. It worries me to see uh, society sort of stampeding off a cliff, you know, to, to for no reason whatever, you know. Here's something that CO2 that is beneficial to the earth, which has been demonized and turned into a, a uh, <laughs> so-called pollutant. I mean, you and I both uh, breathe out uh, two pounds of CO2 a day. You know, there are eight billion humans, so multiply two by two pounds a day, where just humanity existing is putting all this CO2 into the air, you know. And, and this is supposed to be a pollutant. You know, that's kind of dangerous. First of all, it's a lie. And secondly, there are these implications that the real problem is not CO2, it's there are too many people. And uh, many of the extremists on, on this uh, CO2 camp say, yes, there are too many people. We can't afford any more than one billion people on the earth. And so uh, you look around, uh, well, there are eight of us here, which seven of us have to disappear, you know. So that, that's really a dangerous yes. direction to go. Yep. Whenever people become more prosperous, the rate of population growth uh, nearly stops or it yeah. often becomes negative. So if people want to control the population in the world, the worst thing you could do would be to impoverish everybody, which is what these policies would do. Yeah. You know, if you make people in Africa and South America and Asia prosperous, the, the population will stop growing and it will start to shrink. Yeah. And that's always happened. It's happening in Japan now. It's already happening in China. China is already, you know, down to just replacement levels. Would you say that fossil fuels save the earth? I, I think more, more CO2 will help to save the planet. Absolutely. But, <laughs> uh, Dr. Happer, you worked for Trump. Why should I believe you? Well, uh, you, you don't have to believe me, of, of course. Uh, I, you know, th this is my opinion, which I had for many years before I worked for Mr. Trump. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, but the other side, you know, uh, for ex they work for governments which pay them large amounts of money every year to come up with uh, scary results. So I think the most conflicted uh, participants in this debate are the climate scientists because their jobs depend a hundred percent on a climate emergency. If the climate emergency went away, we would rethink how we're spending money, you know, for climate research. I don't think it would stop because climate is important, but it would no longer be true that you would have to come up with the ever more scary research result every year to get funded for the next year. So there are all sorts of reasons for a uh, good climate science and it shouldn't be based on on this phony emergency that has been ginned up you know by power lusting you know fanatics <laughs>
Thank you very much. You're welcome. <laughs>